Welcome to chapter three of our discussion and analysis of Wuthering Heights. So let's continue. Have a look. And the first thing is, so we have Lockwood effectively is now going to have to stay at the Heights and he's being escorted up to a room by Zilla, the servant, but without Heathcliff's knowledge. And interesting, foreshadowing what's going to happen in this chapter as well. She'd only lived there a year or two and they had so many queer goings on, she could not begin to be curious. So it's a place where lots of strange things happen. It doesn't say whether it's supernatural or not, but definitely some strange things happen. So, over the page, and oh, I've changed colour. Isn't that mysterious? That's a supernatural event in itself. But, it's not really... Then we have this, again, a kind of cultural reference to this sort of old-fashioned couch. And he means that's like a bed, basically. Not our sense of a couch in the modern times. Very conveniently designed to obviate the necessity for every member of the family having a room to himself. So what, well, what Bronte means is she's describing a kind of, like a room within a room. So it's like an oversized almost like a wardrobe but it's got a bed inside it so you can have multiple people in the same room but they've got their own private space it's a pretty good idea actually it could make a comeback who knows but anyway we have Lockwood secures himself in it there's a ledge at the back and there's a table there at the back which the ledge makes a table if you see what I mean and he felt secure against the vigilance of Heathcliff so he thinks oh well no one knows I'm here and I can actually sleep for the night while it's really snowing badly outside, then he notices all the carving in the wood itself and all these books as well. The writing, has, however, was nothing but a name repeating all kinds of characters, large and small. Catherine Earnshaw, here and there, very to Catherine Heathcliff and then again to Catherine Linton. So right now, this doesn't seem amazingly significant, but it actually is. And it's talking about the main Catherine of the novel and these change of surnames mean much more as you go through the novel. So really, it's foreshadowing future events of the novel, which are in the past. It's the confusing structure of the novel. So Lockwood is going to go to sleep up here. He's having a look at these words. They would not rested five minutes when a glare of white letters started from the dark as vivid as spectres. So there's a sense of the supernatural here. The air swarmed with Catherines, as in the word, like he's having a vision of seeing the word, word swirl around. It's actually very cinematic before cinema even existed, actually, isn't it, when you think about it? Then he wakes up and realises that his, accident, his candle is accidentally burning one of the books. So he starts having a look at it. And so it was a testament, so basically a religious text, a Bible, a part of the Bible in lean type and smelling dreadfully musty, and it was Catherine's, but uh, Catherine's library was selected. Its state of dilapidation proved it to have been well used, though not altogether for a legitimate purpose. So again, notice the pompous style that Bronte gives Lockwood. And he's also making a kind of value judgment here because Catherine has been using... Scarcely one chapter had escaped a pen and ink commentary. So she's actually been keeping a diary inside a religious text or is a testament. It's a book of the Bible, uh, probably New Testament. I'm guessing it might be Old Testament. Who knows? I don't know. But whatever it is, it's part of the Bible and she's keeping a diary in it. Now, one of the recurring themes of Wuthering Heights is it challenges the conventional Christianity of the era and Catherine and Heathcliff, their relationship it defies all convention, and that does include religious aspects as well. And the Earnshaw family, to begin with, become, well, we'll find out all this. I'm getting ahead of myself, but they become kind of disillusioned with um, the, you know, the local church. And Catherine and Heathcliff definitely have no interest in, uh, in following like, the Christianity of the time. Then we have, I was greatly amused to behold an excellent caricature of my friend Joseph. I just highlighted that because I thought that was funny because it's a kind of thing a child would do, isn't it? Like draw a picture of someone annoying. And so there's a really good caricature of Joseph in there as well. I began forthwith to decipher her faded hieroglyphics. So that's again the style of Lockwood as Bronte's given it. Very heightened language. 
which means you know it's it's elevated language it's language that you wouldn't normally use in everyday life and that's to help reinforce that pompous superior personality as narrator that has remember we're not really meant to like him actually i think we're meant to laugh at him a lot of the time so he actually starts reading the diary of catherine and we get reference our first reference to hindley who we'll find out in more detail who he is but he is catherine's brother young catherine's brother his conduct to Heathcliff is atrocious, so again, this is foreshadowing some further details we're going to be finding out later on. Hinley's treatment of Heathcliff. H, as in Heathcliff and I, are going to rebel. We took our initiatory step this evening. So Catherine and Heathcliff do, as children, have rebellious natures. They end up not being able to go down, because of flooding, they can't go down to the church on a Sunday, so Joseph, the servant does a service for them and it lasted precisely three hours so that imagine how incredibly boring that is the school that Bronte and her sisters went to herself was a really it was a really horrible really actually I say horrible it's not that's an understatement It was actually a really cruel school as well and so as Vicar's daughters they could go to this uh, this kind of church school that was really designed for children of clergy and children who didn't have to pay had to wear a special uniform so that made bullying really easy as well but the school was also so abusive children died at this school it was really horrible but anyway as bad as that was another aspect of it which was bad which I think Bronte might be tapping into here and why the novel doesn't present Christianity in a particularly favourable light is because the this school would march the girls across the uh, across the land, <laughs> I couldn't think of the word then, they'd march them across all the farmers' fields and things and the footpaths it'd, through all kinds of weather with inadequate clothing on to get there. And when they get to the church, they'd have to, it was a couple of hours across the fields, then they'd have to, then they'd have to spend the morning service and they'd also have to do even song as well. So they used to have to stay at church all day and then they'd have to all walk back again at night and yeah, children literally died at this school. It was really bad. It was for girls. Um, anyway, so that was at a place called Cowan Bridge, Cowan Bridge School. But anyway, I think there's a bit of this in here. I think part of that biographical detail is coming through here. Then Hindley is running the house as a tyrant because the father by this point has died. So what done already? On Sunday evenings, we used to be permitted to play. This is young Catherine. If we did not make much noise, now a mere titter is sufficient to send us into corners. So this Catherine, though, remember, isn't the same Catherine that Lockwood has met. This is the older Catherine. This is the mother of the Catherine that he's met. Frances is the wife of Hindley. And they're basically just canoodling. Good word, canoodling. And not taking anything seriously, but they don't have to because they're the um, master and mistress of the house. The children clash with Joseph. There's good enough, there's books enough if you read them. Sit you down and think of your souls. So their reaction to Joseph's enforced religious sermon is to took my dingy volume by the scroop and hurled it into the dog kennel, vowing I hated a good book. Heathcliff kicked his to the same place. So again, you can see the symbolic rejection of Christianity effectively here from the young Heathcliff and Catherine as well. So I just saw that I accidentally cloned a page there, but it doesn't matter. So we have Joseph again. Master, come hither. Miss Cathy's riven the back of the helmet to salvation. On Heathcliff's paws, is fit into first part at his broad way to destruction. Basically, it's just Joseph in his own kind of religiously hypocritical way. He's concerned about Catherine and Heathcliff's rejection of Christian teachings and he thinks they're on their path to damnation, basically. Then they lock Joseph locks them up. Old Nick, that's a reference to the devil, as a nickname of the devil there. That's where the word nickname actually comes from, actually. And we each sort a separate nook to await his advent. So this is Catherine's private diary, so it's not necessarily meant to be read by anyone else. But 
you can see that she's got complete contempt for Joseph's uh, teachings there. Not only that, you know, it's boring, but they just they're just rebellious, aren't they? Really, they have this idea of actually then sneaking out and then. Yeah, they were sneaking out and running across the, across the moors. A pleasant suggestion, and then if the surly old man come in, he may believe his prophecy verified. We cannot be damper or colder in the rain than we are here. So they think, well, actually, we could sneak out, and then he'll think we really have been taken by the devil. Ha, 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 and off they go running off. So it's quite controversial kind of ideas for the time, when you think about it. So we have... A skip in time here. So the idea of, I suppose, Catherine fulfilled her project for the next sentence, took up another subject. She waxed lacrimose. Again, look at the language that Lockwood is given by Bronte. It's very elevated, very high, heightened. Lacrimose is, is related to crying, basically. But how often do you hear that word every day? You can now, but you don't use it every day normally, do we? So she's been crying, you see. Poor Heathcliff. Hindley calls him a vagabond and won't let him sit with us nor eat with us any more. And he says he and I must not play together and threatens to turn him out of the house if we break his orders. He's been blaming our father, how dared he, for treating Heathcliff too liberally and swears he will reduce him to his right place. So this is, again is designed to intrigue the readers because you think, well, hang on, Heathcliff is really wealthy now, you know, in the present day of the novel of Lockwood's time. But Heathcliff here, he seems to be very much abused and reduced to a kind of servant status effectively and but it's so what's gone on so this is designed to intrigue then we have more of Lockwood is falling asleep and he has these dreams about this religious service actually coming up here the Reverend James Brandrum in the chapel of Gimmerdon Sow so this is basically a fit in effect actually yeah as a reverend that's not technically the right word but it is technically um I think it would be counted as a vicar then we have he has another dream. I began to dream almost before I ceased to be sens sensible of my locality. So this is all good because Gothic fiction, you often have like liminal spaces and liminal spaces are places between places. And that includes dreaming, you know, when you're between asleep and awake, these or, or when you're nodding off and that kind of drowsiness between sleep and wakefulness. And then dreams themselves are like liminal spaces where the normal rules of reality are suspended and altered so he basically has this extended dream imagining that he's walking back with joseph and then he ends up they end up in the chapel this is still in the dream this is all in the dream an elevated hollow near a swamp whose peaty moisture is said to answer all the purposes of embalming on the few corpses deposited there so that's a very gothic image of there's a basically a chapel and where people dead boys bodies are buried they're basically being kind of mummified and preserved by the PT earth that's around it. So it's a very kind of gothic image there as well. But it also links to nature as well. And a lot of the themes in this novel is there's an idea of the transcendent power of nature as well. So if corpses are being preserved in the peat, it's like there's a sense of time is being kind of overwritten from its normal rules, effectively. But it's by the power of nature, even though that is what happens in nature, actually. But then he's got this incredibly long sermon divided into 499 parts, each fully equal to an ordinary address on the pulpit and each discussing a separate sin. So Lockwood is having a dream about being a very boring religious service. It's uh, not a very exciting dream, at least so far, but it does tap a little bit, actually, thinking about it. Eventually, James, the vicar, kind of turns on Lockwood. Brethren, execute upon him the judgment written. Such honour have all his saints. So James, the, the, in this dream, James Brandrum, the, the vicar, sets all of the other churchgoers on Lockwood. I like to imagine this is like a, those scenes like from a zombie film and he's being attacked by people with loads of... It says they've got clubs and sticks and things. They've got this sort of... It's not really like zombies, but that's how I imagine it anyway. I think it's quite quite a fun image that it turns out it was only the branch of a fir tree when he thinks he's being hit by these clubs it turns out that it's just a tree knocking against the window and he wakes up so Lockwood's having a very peculiar night but it's about to get even more peculiar in the most famous or one of the most famous sequences in the whole novel which he has now, it could be a dream it could be some kind of supernatural vision it could you know, really be a ghost you can decide that as you're looking at it as well. So here's the knocking at the w window. 
I must stop it nevertheless. I muttered, knocking my knuckles through the glass and stretching an arm out to seize the important branch. So he's like stopping the branch, you know, knocking at the window. And then he grab, grabs the fingers of a little ice cold hand. The intense horror of nightmare came over me. I tried to draw back my arm, but the hand clung to it and a most melancholy voice sobbed. Let me in, let me in. Who are you? I asked, struggling meanwhile to disengage myself. Catherine Linton, he replied shiveringly. Why did I think of Linton? I had read Earnshaw twenty times for Linton. I'm come home. I'd lost my way on the moor. Now, I think this, I've highlighted this. Why did I think of Linton? The parenthesis here, which is a more fancy word for brackets, is a proper term for it, parenthesis. It's a rhetorical question. Now, the fact that he hears this ghost's or this dream of a ghost again you decide but the reason it's Catherine Linton and that is actually the correct name when he'd already said I'd read Earnshaw 20 times or more it's either a coincidence or it is supernatural because that was the real name again I like to think of that as evidence that it's a supernatural event because it's accurate he would have been more likely to think of the name as Catherine Earnshaw but he didn't he thought of it as Linton and at this point in the novel Lockwood doesn't know the full story, does he? But you can change. You don't have to agree with me. It's absolutely fine. I'm come home. I'd lost my way on the moor. Terror made me cruel, and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, I pulled its wrist onto the broken pane and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Still, it worked. So I find it interesting where maybe this represents the brutality of Wuthering Heights and the violence of Wuthering Heights is actually influencing Lockwood at least in this dream or in this supernatural vision or whatever you want to call it but you see what I mean he's like he's he's becoming really violent himself it's quite a graphic little sequence there as well let me in how can I I said at length let me go if you want me to let you in fingers relaxed I snatched mine through the hole hurriedly piled the books up in a pyramid against it because remember if you want to stop a ghost from sticking its arm through a window just pile some books up in front of it basically that's absolutely fine ghostbusters didn't need all that equipment just a pile of books it is 20 years mourned the voice 20 years i've been away for 20 years so there's details in this dream or vision or supernatural experience that are proven later on in the novel to be accurate so he ends up, like we do when we have a nightmare or we're having some kind of frightening dream, he screams out and Heathcliff comes in. Yeah, now Lockwood's going to be in a bit of trouble, isn't he? Because Lockwood isn't happy. No, Lockwood, sorry. Heathcliff isn't happy because Lockwood is in this room he's not meant to be in. But Lockwood isn't happy anyway, is he? But anyway. Then Lockwood condemns Zilla as thinking he set him up basically like she wanted to prove that this room was haunted so Lockwood very quick to blame a poor innocent servant well maybe she did do it but I don't think she did I suppose that she wanted to get another proof that the place was haunted at my expense well it is swarming with ghosts and goblins so more supernatural references there as well you have reason in shutting up I assure you no one will thank you for a doze in such a den what do you mean asked Heathcliff and what are you doing Lie down and finish out the night since you are here. But for heaven's sake, don't repeat that horrid noise. Nothing could excuse it unless you're having your throat cut. So Heath is unaware of the supernatural experience that Lockwood has had. I'm not going to endure the persecutions of your hospitable ancestors again. So that again is very heightened language talking about these spirits or ghosts. He mentions about James Brandrum. And that oh yeah, and that makes Catherine Linton or Earnshaw, or however she was called, she must have been a changeling, wicked little soul. Changeling supernatural reference there because that is um a type of fairy. There is a folklore thing of when um fairies would swap a fairy baby with a with a human baby and kidnap the human baby and leave the changeling behind. She told me she'd been walking the earth these twenty years, a just punishment for immortal transgressions, I've no doubt. So Heathcliff does react to this because these details are accurate. So it ends in that exclamatory, um, exclamatory sentence there. And then 
again, remember last chapter, Lockwood made loads of social faux pas. Well, here's another one because it's even worse this time because he because Lockwood realizes, oh, Catherine Linton knew Heathcliff, didn't she? Yeah, so he's goofed. So another faux pas, but this one's much worse. But luckily he stops himself from giving away too much, so he pretends to have more limited knowledge than he actually does. And a rare moment of wisdom from Lockwood, actually. So he makes out it's because of spelling the name over and over again to send himself asleep, like, you know, effectively like counting sheep. So Heathcliff is initially angry, but he does calm down again. And Heathcliff calms down and he lets Lockwood stay and he says, you can stay here or stay downstairs or whatever. And he's going to go as early as possible. Lockwood's going to go back as early as he can because he's completely spooked out and it's not been very welcome. Heathcliff stays, though, because Lockwood can hear Heathcliff in the room. Come in, come in, he sobbed. Cathy, do come. Oh, do once more. Oh, my heart, darling, hear me this time, Catherine, at last. So he's hoping that the ghost will reappear, but it doesn't. I've highlighted Grimalkin because it's the name of the cat in Wuthering Heights. And it's a common name. And if you do Macbeth, you'll know this anyway, but it's a common name for a witch's cat. So it can't be a coincidental choice from Bronte there, considering what we've read so far in the novel, is it really? Then we have an encounter with miserable old Joseph as well, but I'm not going to dwell on that one. Also, Hareton Earnshaw, who basically starts getting up swearing, but because of the era in which this book is written, we kind of have to imply that actually Earnshaw is knocking into things and swearing, trying to find stuff, trying to find a spade, I think, actually, yeah, to dig out the snow, isn't it? So then again, because of the time it's written, sometimes you've got to look more carefully and you read between the lines and you see things. He broke out as I entered, turning to his daughter-in-law. This is Heathcliff shouting at young Catherine and employing an epithet as harmless as duck or sheep, but generally represented by a dash. He means cow. He's calling her something like a silly cow, you know, like a, as a sexist pejorative, you know, an insult pejorative. And what's happening is because of uh, the era that Bronte's writing in, 19th century, she's using a, a, a technique known as circumlocution. So Lockwood is using circumlocution, which is a great word in itself, circumlocution. So it's like circus, but with an M and then locution, L-O-C-U-T-I-O-N. And it means just talking around something. So he's trying to not be rude himself. I highly as you trash because everyone thinks that's an American word. But look, here it is in a 19th century novel. Yeah, I just thought that was. Fun. Then we have. So often in versions, adaptations, when Lockwood does actually make it through into it. You don't get a lot of this stuff. There's more that happens than you normally see in adaptations of it in films and and uh, TV dramas and things. And Lockwood doesn't even make it into some of them. But Heathcliff does actually accompany Lockwood back to Thrushcross Grange, really, because Lockwood is uh, renting a property off him. So it, when you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for Heathcliff to be really horrible to him. He doesn't necessarily want to be best chums with him, but... He's going to pay money if he annoys Lockwood too much. Lockwood's just going to say, well, I won't bother renting this out, thanks. I think I'll go somewhere else. So we have a nice metaphor. It was well he did for the whole hill back was one billowy white ocean. So it's all been very snowy. So we've obviously many nature references in the whole novel there as well. Then... Oh, there's a sense here as well of how big... And again, some adaptations don't really do this... Thrushcross Park, that is part of Thrushcross Grange. Lockwood's renting that. He must have a lot of money because it's huge. Because we halted at the entrance of Thrushcross Park saying I could make no error there. It's not what Thrushcross Grange, the house and the parkland, is the opposite to Wuthering Heights, where Wuthering Heights is wild, rough, unkempt. Thrushcross Grange and its surrounding park is cultivated, maintained decorative and kind of peaceful and calm it's not as exposed to the weather in the same way even though it's covered in snow but it's also noticed it's safe for Lockwood to walk back anyway this house is so big look the porter's lodge is untenanted as yet 
So there's no one living in the in the porter's lodge. So whether that would be someone would be paying Heathcliff or as a sublet, I don't know. And I'm probably going too much into the detail of thinking about the property there. Who cares? I'm not going to think too much about it. But what I do think is significant is it gives a suggestion of how big that property is and how wealthy Lockwood must be. And by extension, Heathcliff is even richer. You know, so because he owns it. And Lockwood is just renting it. My human fixture is that metaphor for who we find out soon is to be uh, Nellie Dean, who is another one of the key narrators of the novel. And her satellites means all the assistant servants as well. Even though I do like to imagine she's got you know electronic space satellites hovering around her, but that would just be ridiculous. So I'm sorry. And then I am drawn to my study, feeble as a kitten, Almost too much so to enjoy the cheerful firing, smoking coffee which the servant has prepared for my refreshment. So look at the kind of again the pathetic language that's used to describe Lockwood here. My study feeble as a kitten. He's he's quite a weak man, isn't he? He makes these faux pas. He's pompous, and then also he said almost too much to enjoy it. He does enjoy it though, doesn't he? Like he is sitting there, so he likes to be pampered. As you can tell through his creature comforts. So. That's chapter four now, so I'm going to stop there and we'll do that one afterwards. I hope you found that useful. Thank you for listening. Like, comment, subscribe, notification bell. Look at any other videos that may be of interest to you. And thank you for listening. Don't have nightmares. Bye.